let me take you through the program. Um, program flow, the um, introduction of the facilitator. I will introduce Jay in a minute. And then we hand over to um, Johan Berger, who is he's got a long history with the business school. And we're very proud to have him also from Dubai um, speaking on this topic. Thereafter, the, there will be a question and comment section, and we love it to be an informal engagement. Ask your questions, share with us your thoughts. Um, we have also our chairperson from Ghana, Dr. Geraldine Abaidu here, and she will also engage on aspects from Ghana that Johan will be talking about. So please interact with us. And then we hope to finish by about six, uh, um, South African time, 1830. Jay, if I can introduce you and hand over to you, a real estate developer in the Middle East and currently he resides in Saudi Arabia. So our chapter in UAE is not only, it's broad, it is, covers the whole region. He serves on the board as a non-executive director of I7 Capital and a venture, a venture capital firm in South Africa. He has served on this alumni committee since January um, this year, beginning of this year. Jay, we're very happy to have you on the committee. He holds a bachelor degree in quantity surveying, PG dip from us um, in business administration and the MBA from the business school. He has a passion for startups, collaboration, and teamwork. Thank you, Jay. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Christelle and Lizelle. Um, tonight, we have someone very special, um, Johan Berger, that's going to take us through um, what his experiences have been in Africa and dealing in Africa. Uh, Johan Berger is, uh, is the business development manager of executive education at the College of Pacific Economics at the UAE University in Abu Dhabi. He is the former director of the NTU SBF Center for African Studies and a senior lecturer in international business at the Nanyang Business School in Singapore. He previous, previously served as the director of international programs at the University of Stellenbosch, where he has taught strategic management, general management, and financial analysis to MBA students. In addition, he held, uh, he held positions of research associate at the Institute for Future Research at the USB, for whom he still serves as, as a researcher. His research interests include business models, the emerging markets, growth opportunities, and Africa. He has published numerous articles on Africa in, in various publications. Johan has an MBA, a cum laude, if I may say, from the University of Stellenbosch, several honors, honors degrees, and a bachelor's degree in military science. He is unashamedly an Afro-optimist. Please join me in welcoming Johan Berger. Hello, Jay. Thank you for the introduction. If I'm just going to put on my slideshow. Um, yes, Made in Africa. It is a topic which is receiving a lot of attention now with the launch of the African um, continental free trade area, which is focusing on promoting business, trade, manufacturing, you name it, within the African continent. Um, so Made in Africa for me is more than just a bunch of statistics. Um, over the past five, six years, I've kept track of various instances and various sectors um, in Africa, looking at aspects of manufacturing of value adding. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is not throw a bunch of statistics at you, although I will be looking at that too, but address certain sectors and show upon developments in those sectors. I will not be stating the obvious such as, you know, there are 20, 30, whatever number of motor vehicle manufacturers in South Africa, but look at those areas which are not necessarily all that well known. Um, aspect which Africa, in terms of making manufacturing, is concerned is the issue of value addition. 
what we are finding is that a lot of Africa, many economies are dependent on commodity exports. The UN report actually referred to specific to Central Africa and West Africa. And they showed that about the commodity dependence increased by 20% as West Africa exports 95% of its commodities. Now, this is something which is prevalent throughout Africa. Nigeria per se exported raw materials valued at 33.5 billion last year. And this led to about close to a 42% depreciation of the Naira against the US dollar since 2016, and about 17% from 2019 to 2020. So exporting raw materials does to import them later on at three times the price is not conducive for Africa, losing out on jobs, uh, skills development, et cetera. Now, if we look at Kenya, another country which is prominent in Africa on the eastern side of the continent, manufacturing is a major pillar of the big four agenda of President um, Ken, uh, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. Um, he formulated this and made manufacturing a pillar of the economy due to the fact that com uh, the contribution of manufacturing to GDP dropped from over 12% a few years ago to only 7.6% in 2019. And the goal of this big four agenda, the manufacturing part thereof was to increase the 7.6 to 15% by 2022. It is already now the end of 2021 and they are not close to that. So this is not something that we will probably see. Now, what we have seen also, some countries taking quite harsh steps. I'm showing you upon Uganda, which recently banned the exporting of raw materials then to encourage local companies to add value before export. Um, Uganda per se, I showed upon you, uh, Nigeria just now, looking in the 90s, Uganda per se, 69% of raw materials being exported and literally, importing it later on at three times the price that they got for it. Other countries include then Nigeria, Rwanda, and they are by no means the only ones. As I've said, a host of countries in Africa dependent on the um, export of commodities. A sector that is receiving a lot of attention globally, um, based uh, from a global perspective on Africa, is then the motor vehicle manufacturing sector. So let's have a look at a few stats. Africa accounts for only 1% of the cars sold worldwide, despite having 17% of the world's population. That 1% compares to 30% of China, 22% of Europe, and in North America, you can see there's 17. McKinsey has shown that on average 44, there are an average 44 vehicles per 1,000 people with a global average of 180, and then the rich USA looking at 800 per 1,000 people. What we're also seeing is that local manufacturing and local brands are growing as well, but this in itself created a paradox, which I will later show upon. Um, one thing that makes Africa so attractive for global uh, auto manufacturers is the fact that Deloitte has predicted that by within the next 15 years, uh, Africa's passenger vehicle sales could reach 10 million um, units. A figure that will probably grow given the fact that Africa's urbanization rate currently at about 49% will shoot up to about 58% by 2050. And we're seeing a strongly growing um, consumer class at the same time. International brands in Africa, thick and fast. Do you think of it and they're there? BMW, Daimler, Volkswagen, Nissan, Toyota, um, then also, China with BYD and Hyundai, both recently stating that they will be opening a plant in Morocco. Now, I'll get back to Morocco shortly. Um, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, both on the west and the uh, east coast of Africa. Uh, we have global car makers interested in assembly plants. Uh, instead of manufacturing, for various reasons, amongst others, the number of people of the purchasing power, um, but they've been coming selective as to where they want to be uh, and looking at countries with upside potential. In addition to South Africa, Morocco, two of the 
obvious ones, Egypt coming in at the third highest producer of cars in Africa, then you're also seeing then those other three large players, both in the west and the east side of Africa. Um, then obviously there are interesting ones, such as, for example, Rwanda, which only has about 10 million, I lie, a GDP of 10 million um, US and a population of 12 million, which gives you about 800 per capita GDP, but also receiving attention. Morocco, country that has taken over from South Africa as the largest automotive manufacturer in 2018 already, with cars being the, uh, the country's main export, 27% as I've put in there for you. Um, 2019, they manufactured 360,000 cars close to, uh, with um, South Africa following close to 349,000 cars. The benefit that Morocco has is the fact that it lies close to Europe and it has a number of free trade agreements with Europe per se, the US, Turkey, the UAE, and the Middle East and elsewhere. Not all African countries have this benefit and then they concentrate on the mostly smaller local markets. Now, French motor vehicle manufacturers in Morocco, you're looking at PSA, you're looking at Renault with both substantial uh, market share in those countries. Um, you know, the, the, the opening up the factories per se lead then to other car supplies moving in. You can see there the PSA factory led to 27 leading car supplies moving into the country. Ghana, interesting player there, recently adopted over 30 standards to enable organizations in Ghana to um, assemble and later on manufacture the cars. Ghana is interested in positioning itself as the new manufacturing hub for Africa with its one district, one factory um, initiative. And it has been stated they will soon be commissioning four new vehicle assembly plants as part of this process of becoming a car manufacturing hub. Um, Volkswagen, Nissan, Hyundai um, joining other players, Kia, uh, such as um, Sinotrack and um, Toyota as well. Local brands are receiving more attention. Um, seeing them in Ghana with the Kantanka, Kenya, I will show upon this now, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda. The, some of the challenges they face then is having the problem of brand recognition, struggling against the strong brands of global players, service infrastructure, small local markets, and then obviously the requirement of significant upfront investments. There's a rule of thumb that says that to have a thriving auto manufacturing sector, you more or less require a minimum GDP per capita of three and a half thousand US. Obviously very few countries in Africa meet this requirement. This does not yet stop the large players and also then the development of local brands. A um, couple of requirements for success for local brands, you can see them themselves need efficient local supplier base, Financing is a major challenge and obviously competing against secondhand vehicle imports, which is a major issue in Africa. Um, then dealing with the highly fragmented after sales market. You need to deal with these issues then to be successful in this industry. Typical local brands, I'll get back to Nigeria again, but you have the Innocent Motors, which um, has sold 10,000 vehicles since its inception in 97. 1987 rather. Tunisia, it's Wallace car, Ghana with Kentanka cars, which I mentioned just now. Um, they even started manufacturing an electric vehicle in December 2019. In addition to the Innocent that I've just mentioned, Nigeria um, also has the Nord, which um, recently um, entered Nigeria as a fully Nigerian auto company. It has five models. Uh, so seeing that quite a, a good sign of the development locally. You have then Dangote Group with, uh, have bought Shackman trucks, which is assembled at their number of motor manufacturing company limited factory in, in, in Inugu, where about 90% of these trucks are for the Dangote Group. Um, Uganda, having the Kira electric vehicle, which is incidentally very interestingly built by students at the Makarere University in 2011. And then subsequently, they started then the Kira Motor Corporation, which has then designed and built three concept vehicles, um, all uh, environmentally friendly models. Egypt, starting with the manufacturing of buses, 
Um, Photon, a, G, a, a Chinese company, will manufacture these buses 500 a year for a total of 2,000. Kenya, you have the, Mobi, uh, the Mobius. You have the Proton from Malaysia, which is not necessarily um, local, but also complementing then the local ones over there. Um, Simba Corporation, a group in Kenya, assembles the Mahindra pack, uh, pickups uh, um, locally. Um, and then you also have the PSA group from France, um, et cetera, developing partnership to assemble the Peugeot in, the, um, in Kenya itself. Now, the reality is when you look at the motor vehicle sector, various countries outside of the traditional sources are now building and assembling cars within Africa. Um, nobody would have thought a few years ago that countries such as Rwanda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, I did not touch upon the last two for various reasons, um, but nobody would have thought them as motor vehicle assemblies. Now, the paradox that I spoke about early on is that on the one hand, we're seeing governments enticing the large players, um, the Kias, the Hyundais, the Fords, the uh, VWs of the world, to develop manufacturing and or assembly plants within the country to get the benefit of greater jobs of import substitution and upstream and downstream opportunities in the whole motor vehicle in, uh, value chain. But on the other hand, these cars and manufacturers are then competing against a local motor vehicle brand, which they would also like to get off the ground. So their governments are tra treading a fine line on this issue of a local versus foreign. Um, and as I've mentioned early on, we're finding that quite a number of markets do not meet this per capita GDP of a benchmark of, of three and a half thousand US. Another sector, ladies and gents, that are becoming, or that has become rather uh, quite interesting and active is textile manufacturing in Africa. Um, in Nigeria, um, the Central Bank of Nigeria had invested more than 300 million in the textile value chain within in that specific instance with the objective of enhancing the capacity of generis to end the import of cotton and to export the capacity utilization of these generis. It resuscitated 19 of them. Um, and the CBN views this as vital to support a sector which they view as important for jobs, economic self-sufficiency, um, diversification, self-sufficiency, et cetera. Uh, Rwanda, interesting story that we see over here. In 2015, the East African communities, there's about six countries there, they announced tariffs to end the import of cheap secondhand clothing, which was limiting the growth of their own local garment industries. The U.S. said, but this is not really aligned with the um, African Growth Opportunity Act, and that they would have a problem from the U.S. side to allow this kind of thing. The other members of the East African community then stepped away from this intention, but then only Rwanda said, right, we will continue with it. And then in 2018, they then introduced this tariff of $4 per kilogram. The US subsequently responded and said, right, there's a 30% tariff on imports on Rwandan clothing, which effectively closed the US market for, for Rwanda in terms of textile. Um, what now happened was that the local producers expanded their products from uniforms to ordinary clothing, and we found that the Chinese factories in Rwanda were now exporting instead to the US, now switched their exporting efforts to Europe with the intention then to build manufacturing sites in, in Tanzania to target the US market with the AGOA arrangement. An unintended effect of all of this, the Rwandans are now buying cheap imported clothing from China. Uganda, something similar, stimulating the large scale economic um, cotton production to also scale up domestic value addition, create jobs and address the structural and policy uh, 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 bottlenecks. They have established five new vertically, vertically integrated textile mills. Um, Whereas they're only now looking at 10% of the 30,000 tons of lint being produced lo uh, locally. Uh, under this new strategy, this percentage will be raised to 75% of lint production. South Africa has seen the sad story as initially way back on its textiles industry, which shed about um, between 140 to 160 jobs. Um, the import of clothing, et cetera, from abroad increased from 336 million 
in 2000, that's US dollars, to almost 4 billion, close to 20 years later. What we're now seeing is that local producers, local retailers are switching over and focusing on uh, uh, procuring from local manufacturers. Uh, the Fushini Group announced in November this year that they would locally manufacture 30 million pieces of clothing annually within four years. Um, they saw 72% of their clothes locally with offshore accounting for 28%. Um, and there's renewed interest in local production, which I will go a bit further in now, then being ascribed to the fact that COVID-19 had disrupted international supply chains, um, indicating to, uh, to, to, to retailers that they had to reduce their, their reliance on imports from Asia. And then obviously local manufacturing, allowing them to respond faster to changing fashion styles and um, customer preferences. Um, South Africa, furthermore, you're seeing two words, Mr. Price, Game, Woolworths, Pick and Pay Clothing, Pep Clothing, all committing and actually procuring and producing locally. Uh, Game, for instance, they um, produce or they source 90% of their range locally, with 25% of the range being locally manufactured, um, and they in intend to increase this significantly. Um, yeah. The retailers themselves have committed to boost locally produced goods to 65%, up from the current 44%, the 65% by 2030. Now, this reasoning behind um, localization and, and other pointers regarding this is that with the huge market and relatively low labor costs, moving to Africa is becoming an, an increasingly attractive option uh, for global producers. Uh, foreign uh, exporters can either look for other markets or they can move their production capacity to Africa. With the African continental free trade area, this will become increasingly an option that they would now have no other uh, option but to adopt. The benefits you can see there for themselves, locally manufactured goods are more profitable, shorter lead times, etc. So fashion changes can be quicker or can be, uh, can be adapted to much faster. Um, more jobs and then obviously currency volatility, getting some protection against that when you produce locally. Not all of it can be dealt with, as you can see, that the um, local manufacturing still relies on um, heavily on economies of scale. You're setting the continent with uh, aging skills base, unstable power supply. I heard stories about load shedding and rising electric costs. So it's not all rosy for manufacturers in that regard. Pharmaceutical sector for me is a very interesting one. Um, I'm gonna show you the slides and talk about it and the challenges, but while you read there in the challenges, what is important as far as this is concerned is that between 80 to 100% of Africa's pharmaceutical needs are imported. A lot of it from the generic version. The question that we should be asking is why is Africa importing generic medication when they could be manufacturing it locally? If you look at the fact that, yes, we're sitting with small fragmented markets, it's difficult to move around in Africa. That's why Africa does a lot of business outside of the continent and not necessarily with each other. And hopefully the African continental free trade area will adopt this. Um, but with AFCTA, we also have the, the benefit of easier travel, a larger integrated market, um, more policy coherence, because we should be talking to each other to a much greater extent. Pharma in Egypt, the Egyptians built this Gypto Pharma city, one of the largest pharmaceutical cities, where they uh, will be trying to become a regional hub for the manufacture of medication. The country imports currently 15% of its medicine needs. Ethiopia, the same thing. We pro, they are uh, currently, they would start manufacturing its COVID-19, uh, its own COVID-19 test kits, um, then looking at exporting, also looking at a veterinary drug manufacturing plant, um, which should cover 15% of the local demand. Pharma also in Kenya, um, Manufacturers only there hold 30% of a $1 billion market. This is in um, the, uh, the, the country itself. They have failed to tap, the report speaks of what they fail, failed to tap into this lucrative um, 
immunological and cardiovascular market worth about 711 million US. Um, what is for me of interest is the fact that currently Kenya's exports to commercial, which is the common market for East and Southern Africa, uh, ranging from Egypt and Libya right down to Tanzania, um, the East African community and the rest of Africa amounts to 63 million US with a total market of 13.6 billion. It's a subtle difference. An increase of only 5% in Kenya's share of this total African market would amount to exports worth 678 million, which is quite significantly higher than its current exports of 63 million. Nigeria's challenges more or less the same that we've seen in the rest of the country, other than the fact that we of the continent rather, we're seeing also 98% of raw materials um, being used in the production of medicine in, Afri in Nigeria being imported. Um, and, and unfortunately, we're seeing there, and not only there, that foreign seems to be better than local. So there's a greater trust in imported drugs than there is in local manufactured ones. Counterfeit drugs, a major source, not only in Nigeria, let's be clear about that. It's throughout Africa, people are using fake drugs, which is to the you know, one, one wonders why people would do something like that, but then money talks probably. Funding, also a big major challenge, not only in Nigeria. Um, the market is said to grow at a, a CGI, um, GR of about 9.1% between 2017 and 2030. And you're seeing there a couple of the manufacturers in, in Nigeria. Rwanda, interestingly, is sitting with Apex Biotech, which is the first company licensed to manufacture medication. Let's say that you can see there, Rwanda currently imports all its medical drugs consumed in the local market. Um, and should Apex Biotech be up and running, it would reduce the drug import bill by between 10 and 20%. And they would be exporting to its neighbors, DRC, Congo Brazzaville, Central African Republic, Angola and Mozambique as potential markets. I've spoken about this already, the impact of the continental free trade area on the pharma sector, um, providing the opportunity for easier movement of goods and services, of knowledge, um, and a, a larger market and, and, and hopefully collaboration will then lead to a point that you don't sit with, a, with the negative of a small fragmented market. Um, yes. Pharma's, Africa's pharma sector must shift to local manufacturing. As I said in the beginning, importing generic versions of drugs, uh, whereas they could be manufactured locally, is something which Africa needs to pay attention to. Um, what I want to show is on the next slide, the whole issue of franchising. You find, I'm, I'm using an example that I'm uh, uh, aware of, Beacon Pharmaceuticals, not the sweets, the pharmaceuticals in Singapore has a franchising model where they provide the equipment, they provide the training, they provide the uh, uh, formulas, the patents, etc., and the raw materials for companies and other countries to be set up and run on their own with obviously quality control from the holding company. This is something, this is a model that entrepreneurs in Africa should be embracing. It not, there's no need to have large, the likes of CIPLA and those kind of companies to be involved. This is something that can be done at the entrepreneurial level, provided obviously that the necessary policies are in place to ensure quality. Um, but this is a model that should be looked at much closer than it currently is the case. Uh, the leather sector is another sector which I find to be very interesting, given the fact that Africa is exporting a lot of its uh, uh, raw materials just to import them later on when value has been added at a much higher cost. Again, with price differential being to the negative, to the detriment of Africa, losing out on jobs, um, losing the benefits of local manufacturing, and then obviously the pressure on trade balance and then also on um, currency volatility. Uh, when you look at from a fashion perspective, 
a tweet in 2020, in June 2020, in March, and then retweeted in June. A Nigerian tannery supplies leather to luxury fashion houses such as Louis Vuitton and Ralph um, Lauren. Now, this immediately brought a flood of orders as the fashion industry now sought new sourcing opportunities that supported black business. Amongst others, Winston Leather, which is a Nigerian leather brand, had its biggest sales in 30 years in June of that year. Um, in Kenya, interesting, sitting with about 2 million um, cattle, one of the larger herds in Africa, but its share of the 14, close to $14 billion global market for leather at less than 1%. There's a huge potential as they export more than 95% of their raw and semi-processed hides. Um, processing these skins and hides before exportation could at least, uh, could create at least 50,000 jobs and then an increase in the GDP of between 150 to 250 million. Now, the challenge again is the higher cost of local production relative to cheap imports, especially from countries such as China. And then you find also the specter of um, counterfeits. Um, you have low value addition and with the skills deficit. East Africa as a region has a similar uh, situation. You have Ethiopia with a market of more than 100 million, which is an attractive market. And then if you can solve the problem in Kenya, in terms of manufacturing and adding value locally before exporting, this is a model that could be then extra back, extrapolated um, to other countries. The Ati River Leather Park, boasting 14 tanneries, launched in 2020, 2021, two or three months ago, as an effluent treatment plant, 12 modern stalls, um, would create more than 50,000 direct jobs. Again, providing herders and SME hide traders with a ready of market for these hides that usually go to waste. Tanzania, something similar we find there. Uh, it's a weak market, a weak industry, and also needs to uh, get attention. Um, only five small firms currently produce leather footwear in the country. The newly constructed Kilimanjaro International Leather Industries Limited would produce at least 1.2 million pairs of shoes, um, pair of soles between 100,000 and 2 million pairs of soles, and then obviously other uh, leather products, again, with the benefit of uh, direct and indirect jobs and increasing Tanzania's revenue base. Other leather, leather um, industry stories, Rwanda looking at using their leather products for assembly process of VW cars in the country. Malawi, um, annual demand of 19 million pairs of shoes. 2018 only produced 300,000, huge market, huge opportunity. And then the same thing in, in similar, uh, a similar story in Ethiopia, which has two shoe manufacturing plants. This is now the Hujian Group. Um, which pr produces 5 million pairs annually and employs more than 7,000 people. In terms of renewable energy, just a few thoughts. This is a or an industry that is taking off in Africa where renewable energy, looking at solar, wind, hydro, um, geo, uh, uh, thermal, being embraced in an increasing to an increasing extent in the place of either nothing or then coal-fired plants. Um, however, a lot of these solar equipment, panels, batteries, inverters being imported. Germany, China, with China being the cheaper option, also providing quite a reasonable and acceptable quality. Now, you're looking at Tanzania, we see that 65% plus minus of consumers in the rural area use solar, whereas only about 3.5% of consumers in the urban areas use solar. Now, the solar planet company in the country um, will build a solar battery manufacturing plant to address the challenges facing these uh, renewable energy consumers as well as pro solar lights. In Ghana, Francis Boateng, he constructed his solar power solutions in 2016. 
um, and will be, and they are producing then solar electronics in Ghana's first solar panel factory. Um, initially imported is solar panels from China, but they're ma manufacturing them in the country itself, which is the way that we should be going. Egypt, we're seeing the same phenomenon where Mondragon Assembly is built uh, um, a couple of, of, of uh, factories in Egypt for uh, in Egypt, um, Egypt rather for the uh, production of solar panels. Algeria, the same principle. And then interesting enough, even in a country as small with a small setup uh, uh, GDP as Zambia, India's agrawal plans to build a 100 megawatt capacity solar, solar panel manufacturing facility over there with the benefit of jobs, the transfer of skills, a higher level job as well, um, requiring people to be better educated, more higher uh, um, educated as well. South Africa and Kenya, we're also finding uh, the necessary uh, solar and uh, so, uh, renewable energy facilities being produced over there. Agriculture, that is intense. Much can be said about this sector. I'm not going to touch upon it. What I am going to say is that Africa imports between 35 and 41 billion dollars of food per annum while it, it has the ability to feed the world. It now cannot feed itself. Now there's a whole range of issues that need to be dealt with. Um, food where it is produced frequently exported even within Africa where we're looking at issues such as um, uh, modern farming techniques, irrigation a problem, fertilizer a problem, etc. So Kenya has developed a manufacturing uh, uh, or a fertilizer plant recently at a cost of 28 million US. Um, we'll be looking at exporting to Uganda, Rwanda and Burundi. And one has, when one has a look at seeing there's an annual demand of 500,000 tons with 30 plants supply of 1,000 tons. Again, it shows a huge deficit with the concomitant opportunity for somebody to move into Kenya and produce local, uh, uh, um, locally produce the uh, uh, fertilizer there. Um, co cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire, again, a very interesting story. If we look at cocoa industry, um, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire produce about 70% of the world's cocoa. 5% of the total value chain goes back to these countries and more needs to be done as far as that is concerned. Um, Cote d'Ivoire recently launched the building of two cocoa bean processing units and two 300,000 ton storage warehouses to be able to uh, get to a point where they can transform 100% of the cocoa production on site by 2025. Um, ladies and gents, more or less, the last thing that I want to address is the issue of sustainability, not really strictly manufacturing with the product at the end in a very specific sector, uh, uh, sector. But what we are seeing is that entrepreneurs are tapping into various opportunities within the circular economy to come up with unique products within Africa for use by Africans. Now, waste to energy is an interesting story in its own. You can read there about Egypt uh, producing 95, 95 tons of waste annually and wasting or losing on average about 5.7 billion due to waste recovery deficit. And that goes with that. What needs to be done in waste disposal is that Africa sitting on the one hand with a problem as far as waste disposal is concerned, producing millions of tons of waste. And then you're sitting on the other hand with a lot of the countries without sufficient electricity. It is said that about 60 to 64% of Africa's population sit without access to electricity. A small country such as Singapore has six to seven, um, six to seven, um, waste to energy plants, where they generate electricity by means of um, waste incineration. Africa at this stage of the game have two, one in Addis and one in Cape Town. 
Um, sitting with a city like Johannesburg, which has looking for a seventh or the seventh landfill site is being filled, uh, running full, and they're looking for additional sites. The question needs to be asked, given your or the electricity challenges that the country faces, why is not more being done to produce um, electricity through the um, incineration of waste? Um, another point that is, or, or, another field that is very interesting is the use of bamboo. Africa is becoming deforestized. <laughs> Deforestation, a major issue, let's rather put it that way, Let me break down the English language. What we're seeing here, for example, is Ghana making bicycles out of bamboo. Not only they make it, um, we also see saw this in, in Ethiopia. Uh, bamboo has a lot of advantages. It's fast growing, produces a 35% more oxygen than the other trees, um, and helps in it with reforestation, as I've said. In this specific case in Ghana, even the wheels, the gears, the brakes, and the handles are recycled from second-hand steel bikes and refurbished. And only a few of the components, such as tires, are being imported. Even the epoxy used in this manufacturing process made from tree fibers. Um, manufacturing uh, bamboo for manufacturing in Rwanda, well, the same thing. Toilet paper, toothbrushes, clothes brushes, furniture, building materials, all of that. So bamboo, a very interesting thing for production and made in Africa. Biogas. Biogas also a very imp uh, interesting field. Um, various sources. We're seeing this year in where cactus is used as a source in Madagascar. Uh, they will be looking at developing a thousand hectares in the coming years. Uh, the biogas yield of cactus is double that of the main energy crops or waste streams. And one hectare of ca um, cactus can produce up to 400 tons of biomass. So being used also as soil uh, protection and, um, you know, for wind and water erosion. East Africa, in Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda, we are seeing then cow manure and other forms of excrement being used um, to develop organic fertilizer. Uh, the compost is a byproduct of the biogas produc production process, which by the way is then quite a clean form of energy. Also helps as an alternative form of energy so that the pressure on uh, wood as a source of energy, as a source of food, of heat, etc., is then negated and saving then in, in the process um, the trees of Africa. Ethiopia, wastewater, similar thing where they're using um, or producing rather biomethane from wastewater treatment plants. Burkina Faso, biogas from mango waste, from the mango peels. Um, fact that Burkina Faso produces 300,000 tons of ma mangoes tells you that they're not going to run out of a raw material soon. Biogas in Morocco, also using um, uh, 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 organic waste. 75% of the household waste in the cities and 85% of the waste in the rural areas um, are organic. And then this is being then pro processed in um, the anaerobic digesters. Saving or reducing 8 million tons of CO2, generating 10,000 jobs, which is no mean feat. Water hyacinth, another form of production made in, in, in Africa. This is not only in Kenya, but in other parts in, in, in East Africa as well. Uh, the water hyacinth cake, which is formulated or created or produced by steam boiling, drying, crushing, and fermenting, uh, for fermenting this uh, process to make a powder, which is then mixed with minerals and energy-rich materials, um, and then sold at a fraction of the price of soya feed price. Um, Pilot studies showed that farmers had a 20% increase in milk production and a 30% decrease in feed costs. Uh, also then used as a source of heating. Even finding organic fashion where the, uh, we, where the clothing is weaved using organic thread made from banana fibers, palm trees, and pineapple plants. Plastic waste. Plastic, ladies and gents, you would know is a huge problem throughout not only Africa, but the world itself. 
um, very high levels of, of waste in Africa, it's oceans, on land, you name it, it's there. What we are finding in Africa is that various countries are now producing plastic bricks and tiles, which are used, the bricks amongst others, to build schools and houses, tiles obviously for flooring. In South Africa, we've seen plastic being included as an ingredient in tarmac roads, which were tested in the Eastern Cape and KZN. We've seen it also being produced as a form um, of as a, an ingredient for clothing, and then in addition to that, energy generation. Um, the last slide that I have here on, on, on sustainability is in the issue of 3D printers from e-waste. Africa, again, is the recipient of a lot of the world's e-waste, not necessarily to its advantage. But what we have seen is that in, specifically in Togo and in Tanzania, as well as in, in Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, and South Africa, sorry, students are building 3D printers using this e-waste. You know, innovation or necessity rather being the mother of innovation. The venture in Togo builds medical prosthesis. And then obviously you find the more uh, advanced form of 3D printing where in amongst others, Kenya, but they're not the only ones um, using then 3D printing to solve industrial challenges such as 3D printed ventilator splitters to combat COVID-19 and then doctors then also using 3D designs before complex surgeries. Um, Africa's or Kenya's Africa Center for Technology Studies in the Kenyatta University at, um, joined in a partnership to create a center of 3D printing excellence. Um, I have a few minutes left. If you don't mind, just something which I think I'm going to go and have a look at what I would like to show upon. Um, these are extra slides. Shoebuilding in Africa, one would not think it, but other than in South Africa, which we, we find this in some of the other, other larger economies, we are finding that it's becoming a, it's gaining greater focus. Africa's coastal areas are huge and the benefits that they can obtain in the exclusive economic zones are equally high. So there's a strong focus on the various countries' blue economy objectives. And what we are now seeing is that uh, companies such as the Kenya Shipyard Limited in Kenya is starting to produce the country's own shipping, which will then reduce its alliance on foreign built ships and allow it then also to target a small part of the 126 billion global market for ship construction. Even if it only just reduces um, the need to import local foreign shipping into Kenya itself, it has played a major role. We're seeing this also, okay, that's more of the point that I've just made, other countries that host shipyards, South Africa, Egypt, Angola, Morocco, Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal, not all of them have a shipbuilding capacity as they focus on repairs and maintenance. Um, Egypt also built recently, it's uh, or launched a third locally built Gowin class um, Corvette, uh, constructed at the Alexandria Shipyard in cooperation with France's Naval Group. Um, what is important also to, mention, to notice is that even the 16 landlocked countries, of some of the 16 landlocked countries of Africa's 55 countries, or 54 rather, um, they, even they have access to large lakes such as Rwanda and Uganda, and they also require shipping to navigate and benefit these lakes um, economically. Uh, with China's Belt and Road Initiative targeting Africa, maritime corridors along Africa's coast are drivers of development. Uh, and then the CFTA will also require, when Africa starts doing business to, with itself to a greater extent, more sailors, more shipping, and better handled ports, and better managed uh, ports, as far as that is concerned. Jay, I can go on with Armamus and a few others, but I think at this stage of the game, um, I will stop the sharing and then we can open the floor for questions and comments. Thank you very much, Johan, and thank you for a very elaborative discussion on all these sectors. Um, I've got one question from Geraldine from Perfocus Innovation. She says that the trust of foreign goods, uh, the trust of foreign goods versus local ones cuts across most African countries. This phenomenon makes manufacturing, manufacturing in Africa costly. 
what will be the tipping point to turn this around? <laughs> yes, cost is the issue. Um, the foreign is better is another issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, and Africa's manufacturers need to take responsibility for itself. And hopefully something like the African continental free trade area would be the, uh, the factor that leads to this. Um, countries should also lead to local is good. Uh, uh, we should actually actively launch projects to convince consumers that there's nothing wrong with the local product. Uh, some countries have done that consciously. Rwanda is one of them that has pushed for buying local. Um, not only Rwanda, there's a number of others. South Africa now have done it. Um, I've also seen examples of this in West Africa. But it is a challenge. Um, some of the countries, literally, the consumer, and I would certain extent would put it, the more affluent consumer is inclined to say, but, you know, it's from the US, it's from Europe, it must be better than local. Uh, but we need to educate the population, uh, the consumers, as to this issue. Thank you very much. And, and I've picked up, obviously, what you said about the Chinese and how they're doing business in Africa, and we all know that. We know that how they're building roads in Mozambique, how they, they're helping, but also they're taking a lot. So what do you think about other countries? And do they see the necessary benefits of manufacturing and fabricating within South Africa? Or do you think they, they want to, to, to rather keep those job, uh, jobs for themselves in their country? Because that, that's also a bit of a, a, a catch-22. Yes, you can um, do something cheaper elsewhere, uh, but you sometimes sacrifice jobs mm. uh, for your own, your own country and your own people. Yeah. Jay, yeah, um, I think it makes sense. You know, countries don't have friends. Countries have interests. And it's my best interest to have the jobs in my country and then either to export them to another country so that I get the benefit of the jobs um, internally. Um, the reality is, unfortunately, is that we all live in a system where if Africa does not get its fair share of the pie, then Africa's youth are leaving the continent, voting with their feet to go to other parts of the world where they are not necessarily welcome and they create their own problems. Um, the African migrant problem is well known and well recorded. So it is in the best interest of countries globally to help Africa to stop using Africa, let's put it this way, as a source of raw materials and thereafter as the market for value added products. Um, it is not in Africa's best interest and it's not on the long term in the best interest of the world at large to do that. Whether they will actually understand this and do that is another issue. Um, sometimes one wonders when you look at what they are doing, whether they really understand that they need to help Africa keep Africans in Africa um, so that those talented people that are leaving Africa will remain and then push for um, value addition in the continent itself. Just the point you mentioned China. China is not necessarily always equal to poor quality. Uh, I think that would be a fallacy. Are there instances of bad quality in Africa? Yes, there are. I can remember when I was a little kid of five, six years old, where certain countries that are today highly regarded as far as quality was concerned, were then, back, way back then, viewed as being scrap. You got something from a certain country, you would try and say, listen, this is really nonsense. Why do you give it to me? Today, it equates to quality. Your iPhone is made in China. A lot of the golf, top golf equipment sold at wonderful brands in the US made in China. So that would be a fallacy to generalize and say, right, Africa has poor quality. Uh, China has poor quality, sorry. Agreed, agreed. Just uh, one more one more question or discussion point um, before we open the floor to, to everyone else. Is, and I've, I've noticed that, that you haven't addressed this point and, and it's, a, it's, it's maybe a bit of a, a sore point in Africa is 
corruption. And to what extent do you think is that a, a, a point that keep investors and other countries away from our beautiful continent? It's an issue. Let's not fool ourselves. However, if you know it happens, if you know how it happens, you can deal with it. Um, I know of a couple of companies, I've been in Singapore past five years, that are active in Africa, that deal in countries where, which are viewed as being where corruption is rife. And they know about it, they know how to deal with it, and they deal with it successfully. Um, country of a company that I know well, Toleram, I'm going to name it by its name. Toleram does well in Nigeria. It came up with the Indomie noodles over there. I could have mentioned that under food. Um, learned or taught the Nigerians to eat Indomie. They have now partnered with what Kellogg to produce noodles in the rest of Africa, in Egypt and Iswatini, and to export into other countries. They know how to deal with the challenges amongst corruption, amongst others' corruption. So it is there. It is unfortunate it is there. Um, and it needs to be dealt with. But let's be honest. It's not only in Africa where you find uh, uh, um, corruption. Other parts of the world have it as well. And um, yeah, but it, that doesn't take away the fact that it is in Africa and needs to be dealt with. Thanks, John. Um, we've got a question from Wojciech, and I, I wanted to ask him if, whether he wants to ask this question himself um, or do you, you prefer to work through the facilitator. We, we encourage the engagement. Thank you, Wojciech. Uh, you you are muted. muted. Yeah. Now it is possible. Can you hear now? There you go. Okay. Uh, look, uh, I spent many years in uh, Central Europe and Central Asia working on economic reforms over there. And what I found that the common denominator was uh, basically very inefficient commercial courts system. So any kind of investor which is or who is actually contemplating investing in a country where you have problems with this uh, obviously has to build in big margin for safety mm. uh, you know if you cannot execute your contract in a reasonable period of time then basically your contract is where piece of paper is written on what's the situation uh, in africa at the moment uh, Wojciech, I'm not going to give myself an expert on that, but I can just think about one example which actually shows upon the detriment to Africa. Um, you would have seen in Djibouti where you had DP World being replaced as the developer and the manager of one of the ports in Djibouti. Yeah. Um, and taken over by the, by the Chinese. And in spite of a number of international court verdicts against Djibouti, um, they said, thank you, very interesting. However, DP World, you're out. Um, China, you're in. Um, so I think it's an issue of buyer beware. Uh, you need to do your homework and say, in this specific country, yeah. what are we looking at? I think you will probably find in South Africa, in Kenya, there would be a greater respect for the rule of law. You would find that in Nigeria and West Africa and Ghana, um, where, that, where there's a law case that you would have uh, um, access to court and that you can expect um, you know, a, a verdict that's based on the fact. Uh, Nigeria, one would think, oh, John, Nigeria is a problem. However, the, some of the government departments, I'm not talking specifically the tax people, had issues with amongst others, South African company, MTN, not only that, but one of them, and um, you know, charged them with exorbitant amounts. And fortunately, the courts listened to the facts and said, nope, not the case. So initially, where there would be, I want to say, billions of rands and hundreds of millions of dollars 
requested, they would end up with something much smaller. Now, the cynical amongst us would say, Johan, but you know, that actually is a kind of extortion where we would say, let's ask for a hundred million. If we get five, it's a bargain. Um, so it depends on the country in which you find yourself. I would expect Ghana, if one has to look at the trust that Twitter and those guys are playing in it, um, being more aligned with international courts. Um, but yes, I'm not going to venture more than that, Vojcik. Unfortunately, my focus has not been so much on that. Yeah. And something that I probably should take up to a greater extent. I, I can tell you war stories, but um, facts uh, uh, I, I cannot give you other than those that I've given you now. Can I ask another question? Please. Please. Uh, as long as it's not as difficult as the one that you no, asked. No, no, well, I don't know how difficult to say. Look, Johan, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, Africa as potential investment target, whole Africa, yes. especially sub-Saharan, is there any kind of coordinated effort by African Union, for example, to, you know, develop marketing campaign, invest in Africa? kind of generic Africa. I'm not talking about, you know, any specific country, but invest in Africa. Because I'm talking, you know, I'm now in uh, Poland at the moment and knowledge of uh, potential uh, of African market is close to zero. Yeah. And obviously Africa is probably quite good target for investment by medium sized companies. Because, yeah. you know, uh, Countries like Saudi Arabia, if you go into Saudi Arabia with medium capital, you would be probably dead in a few months time. But in Africa with few millions or a few dozens of millions of mm. dollars, you can do quite a lot mm. with relatively, I would say low risk in some way. Mm. But you know, knowledge of these opportunities is extremely limited, at least you know, from position of somebody who is at the moment in Central Europe. Wojciech, not necessarily by the AU, but the African Development Bank okay, yeah. is constantly involved in this kind of thing. Um, you find also the regional economic communities mm -hmm. are launching efforts, um, you know, East African community, um, COMESA, uh, um, ECOWAS, they uh, are launching their own um, attempts, SADC, and obviously the various countries per se. What I find also interesting is that you finding, you know, I'm currently in the UAE, which is one of the top four to five FDI investors in Africa. Yeah. And you're finding that the chambers of commerce of some of the Emirates on their own, Dubai, Emirate of Dubai, Sharjah, Ashman, are arranging with chambers of commerce in Mozambique, Angola, Tanzania, those places, going there, finding for themselves firsthand, what are the opportunities over here? Um, it's a pity that if Poland, you know, knowledge about Africa is, is, is so scarce, um, one would actually, you know, it's a kind of an indictment against the diplomatic representatives of African countries in Poland that they are not making a much better effort. I was in, Africa, in Singapore, the director for Center Afri of African Studies, and there were six um, African countries with embassies in um, uh, uh, Singapore, South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria, um, Angola, Rwanda, Zimbabwe. Uh, some of them were, Kenya, for example, was served from, from, from India, but those were the six. They embraced me gladly as their mouthpiece, as it were, because I had a monthly or bi-monthly rather, event where I would have somebody talk about Africa. We published, and the Center for African Studies in Singapore still publishes on a monthly basis a number of articles and reports on doing business in Africa. Mm. Now, that's the kind of event that can be undertaken by players, uh, uh, um, diplomatic representatives in Eastern Europe. Um, because I agree with you. There is so much opportunity in Africa. It is frightening. It's scary. And when you have the AFC CFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area, kick in with 
you know, which is going to make it more difficult for companies just to top in and to jump in and buy and sell. They would need to have production processes within Africa to be able to benefit from that. So the earlier you, chap, you, you jump in now, you get involved, mm. the easier it's going to be and the lower the investment requirements going to be. Food, as I've mentioned, between 35 and $41 billion of food. Africa is importing loads of rice amongst others. Mm -hmm. It has the potential to produce all of it, you know, what uh, of needs in countries such as Nigeria, um, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire. I'm just mentioning those three because I know of somebody that's there now looking at that kind of opportunity. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Joan. Um, next up, we've got Dr. Geraldine Abedou. Uh, she's, got, she's got a question for you, Joan. Geraldine, you're not allowed to ask on Ghana. Okay, um, actually, it's, it's not a question. I wanted to comment on the corruption bit that um, was asked. Um, you, you made mention of the fact that this is true, but I have observed that the corruption is, is more or less part of an orientation is, is in Ghana. That is what I see, because um, in our cultural setting, um, we have that orientation that anytime you go to so to speak, a big man should go with gifts. And that is what perpetrates the corruption. So I'm thinking um, we have to have a reorientation, even from the basic I mean, level, teaching children that it is, uh, we are not, I mean, liable to bear gifts anytime you have to approach somebody to give you service or to help you one way or the other. That has been, I believe, the basis of the corruption that we see in Africa. If you go to a chief's palace, you have to go with gifts, whether you are poor or rich, before you are attended to another. And that is, I believe that is what has led to, I mean, the increase in corruption, because we think it is something that is normal. It has to be done. It's part of our culture. It's part of our growing up. So I believe that the education that we need to steer yeah. should come, yeah. or begin from the, I mean, the, the basic level. It should be part of the social studies that we give to our children at the mm. primary level mm. or up to the secondary level so that they get the sense that, no, it is not right to be given gifts all the time when you need service, when you need somebody to support you or help you one way or the other. That is uh, my opinion when it comes to, I mean, corruption in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely right. So I okay. think Paul Potgieter has a question as well. Yes, Paul. Uh, so Prof Berger, thank you as always. Phenomenal session. Uh, also to you, Jay Bester. Thank you for hosting it. Um, maybe, maybe Prof, if you can share with us, just in as us being in the UAE and looking uh, outside into the Africa continent, and then most of us also coming from the African continent. What do you reflect on if you look at the UAE leadership and how we structured the GCC within the UAE and consolidated you know, some key reforms? What do you think the African countries can, can either learn or start or stop doing um, that you think would be key catalyst factors for, for Africa? Maybe if you just can reflect for us the one or two things that you think the we, we can learn from, from Africa or how African countries can learn from some of the UAE leadership that you've seen and some of the, yeah. the macro forces that, that they are uh, capitalizing on. Well, yes, um, please, I'm not professor, one name when I'm big. Um, I think when I look at Africa and I look at, at the UAE, for me, first of all, infrastructure. Um, Africa is in dire need of infrastructure. You know, when I started at Singapore in the business, uh, the research center there, there was a requirement of about $95 billion per annum. Within two to three years, the African Development Bank put that at between 130 and $170 billion per annum. So the infrastructure needs to be there. Production, energy, um, water, uh, uh, roads, rail, transport, getting things in and out of Africa, it is crucial. 
Over here, the UAE is a transport hub. Dubai, Abu Dhabi. Um, airplanes coming in, airplanes going out. Ports. They are now building the Khalifa port here in the UAE. It has been built, developing. It's amazing that the work that they're doing over here. That's the first thing, infrastructure and all its different forms. It is easy to move from point A to point B here. Ease of doing business, it's not an issue. Um, so that needs to be addressed. Reforms needs to look at, at a major point. Something, then there's two others that I'm going to touch upon. First, the third thing is security. Uh, you don't find crime yet. You don't even talk about um, terrorism movements inside active in the UAE and the GCC at large. Um, it has its challenges, but generally speaking, you don't have the same issue yet than you have, for example, in the northeast of Nigeria, which you have in Somalia, which you now have in the northeast of, um, of, of Mozambique. I'm not even talking about in the Central African Republic, Mali and those places. So security over here is sacrosanct. Um, the rule of law, together with security, it's also there. Uh, and, and then leadership. There's strong directive leadership. Leadership here is respected. Uh, you know, if you have a look at um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, the Prime Minister, the Deputy President. You're looking at MBZ, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. Uh, you're looking at Sheikh Khalifa, who is the uh, President. Um, the leaders over here are respected. So those are issues which I think play together to create a, an attractive investment environment. Um, Africa has the opportunity to make money. If it gets its infrastructure, its security, its rule of law, um, the ease of doing business, it gets it right, it will smile. Um, Wojciech spoke about the courts, that access and the fact that you know you will get a fair deal is very important. There was something that flashed in my mind and flashed out at the same speed. Doesn't matter. Um, Paul, I've answered your question. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions from the rest of the, the, the panel? Okay. It looks like your informative session has everyone's questions answered. Thank you so much, Johan. Uh, thank you for, to, to USB, the Stellenbosch, and Business, uh, Stellenbosch Business School for hosting this session in collaboration with SABCO in the UAE. Um, thank you for everyone being here. It, uh, it was fantastic meeting everyone. Yuan, again, thank you so much for your insights. I think we all go away much smarter and um, full of in insight tonight. And yes, thank you. Back over to you, Christelle. Hello, thank you so much. Only one small last word from myself. Johan, thank you very much. It was most insightful. You had so much data. I wish I had a photographic mind. It was fantastic. But fortunately, we have it all on um, recording and we will be sharing it with everyone. Thank you, Jay, for your great facilitation, keeping the space together. All participants, thank you for your valuable time spending it with us and for your great questions and engagement um, from Eastern Europe, from Ghana, from UAE. It was really a medley of great um, perspectives, different perspectives. We're very proud of our arrangements and agreement with the um, SAPCO UAE. We are looking forward to the next um, event, I think it's in February with Dr. Andre, uh, Professor Andre Rue from Futures at USB. We're still thinking of, shall it be there <laughs> in person? We hope so, or, or hybrid. Um, but yes, we look forward to future engagements. Um, I know Dr. Candice Boyson apologized profusely for our unexpected loss of connection. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Have a wonderful evening further. And yes, we're proud of you. Thank you. <laughs>